The journey of a male survivor of trauma is often complex and challenging, with many facing unique obstacles that can make recovery and healing difficult. One of the most significant challenges is the stigma and the societal expectations around masculinity, which can make it harder for male survivors to disclose their experiences and seek help. This can lead to feelings of isolation and shame, further complicating the healing process. However, there are many societal interactions and support systems that can aid male recovery and survivor recovery. It is important to explore and identify these in order to provide better support and resources for those that have experienced trauma. In this discussion, we will go deeper into the barriers that hinder disclosure and the social interactions that both harm and aid male survivors in recovery and healing. It is absolutely wonderful to welcome two incredible individuals who have had a big impact on my life today. And I welcome here them here to this talk. Jeffrey Tennant began his career in aerospace, and after retiring, he made significant changes in his life by serving those around him through ministry and at the beginning of his writing career. The ministry of vocation came naturally from volunteering through his life, but the writing career was birthed from the detailing of the struggles to healing from the pain and trauma brought on from being sex trafficked. The desire to help others traveling the same road as he has led to the writing and publishing of his first book, The Way of Escape. The true story of a teenage boy's a miraculous escape from sex traffickers and a healing journey of recovery. When not working, Jeffrey enjoys life with his family and friends, reading, hiking, weight training, cycling, playing guitar, and writing songs. Dr. Glenn Miles is a senior researcher with UP International, and for 25 years he's led INGOs and facilitated research listening to survivors of sexual exploitation, including men and women and boys and girls, as well as transgendered people, as well as researching those with, that have been sex buyers. Glenn teaches graduate and PhD candidates and provides supervision and advises the Butterfly Longitudinal Project, Chad Dye. And Dr. Glenn Miles was also on my thesis committee board and a co-writer with the latest research on familial trafficking of boys. And my name is Ana Lucia Maria Capacheco, and I am a trauma-informed professional in human security with a master's specialization in male survivors of child sexual abuse and human trafficking for sexual exploitation. I've worked with the government of Canada, NGOs, law enforcement, and international organizations on anti-trafficking, advocacy work, database, casework, and global projects. I'm also a member of the Global Association of Human Trafficking Scholars and the author of The Needs and Stories of Male Survivors of Child Sexual Abuse, Exploitation, and Human Trafficking. So a big thank you to Dr. Glenn Miles and Jeffrey Tennant for being here with me today as we talk about human trafficking, healing, post-traumatic growth for male survivors. Jeffrey and Glenn, thank you so much for joining me here today. And I would like to open up this safe space and invite you to share your story with us, Jeffrey. And when you're ready and comfortable, we are here to listen and acknowledge your story as a lived expert. Well, thank you so much, Ina. And uh, thank you, Glenn and, and Michael and, and all of you, uh, your audience, Michael. It's amazing. You all have compassionate hearts that they want to be a part of the solution. So thank you for the privilege to be able to share and be a part of what you're all doing as well. Uh, and uh, um, what happened to me, I was uh, 17 years old and I was on a youth uh, church trip out to Colorado to do uh, some benevolence work. We were going to rehab uh, an elderly lady's home in Leadville, Colorado. And uh, so we were going to do that for a week and then, uh, get to go have fun in, in uh, Colorado. Uh, and uh, what happened was I had a, a girlfriend and uh, she called it a frantic call in the middle of the uh, night uh, at the end of the work week. And uh, and I was in a panic uh, being young and, and I had just had to get home to her right there, I guess, to rescue her. And so uh, I, I was able to go to the bus depot in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I arrived there shortly uh, 
maybe a half hour, hour before sunrise. And, uh, and so I was going to be unescorted and go uh, home to St. Louis on a bus. And uh, so uh, I was approached by a, an elderly man who was very clean cut. He reminded me of one of my friend's fathers who was the superintendent of the school district I lived in. So I was, he set me at ease and he helped me to get into my locker and, and made some conversation and, and I hadn't eaten anything. So uh, he offered to take me uh, to a, a place to get uh, breakfast. And well, what wound up happening was he, he gave me a drink and the car ride and it was drugged. And then he took me to uh, what um, uh, I later found out uh, after all the work I did and memory recoveries uh, was probably a sex trafficking operation similar uh, to uh, somebody like Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, for this to operate in, in uh, the downtown Denver area, it seemed like it was the basement of a high rise and it was like an auction. And so what they did was operant conditioning on, I was the only male that I could see and there were many young females, um, you know, right around that age, probably 14 to uh, 16, 17, like myself, a very young 17, I was very late uh, bloomer. And, uh, and so uh, they, they used uh, drugs, fear, violence, um, and uh, even a female perpetrator uh, with me uh, to kind of seduce me. And then uh, their ultimate goal, I believe, was to um, uh, uh, turn me towards males you know, for, uh, for sexuality. And, um, and apparently they're, uh, uh, they're just, it was a very high powered, high, well-funded operation, I would say that uh, my estimation would be that they would are going to take the young people and sell them internationally and ship them out of the Denver International Airport. And uh, but through uh, I cried out to the uh, Lord Jesus and uh, he rescued me and. Um, uh, he, uh, they actually saw I wasn't going to cooperate at the end there and they uh, just probably tried to overdose me and, and actually did. And the Lord brought me back. And uh, while they thought I was dead, um, the Lord just met, or actually got me up and helped me to walk right past them. They didn't even see me. Um, and I was able to break out of a window on the second floor and jump down and run to safety. And um, so that was, in essence, what happened. Um, and so... Um, very thankful to be here. And I want to uh, just, uh, 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 if I could, uh, I don't want to uh, go too far into what's in the book, uh, but um, I, the Lord brought me a lot of healing because uh, after all the work that I went through uh, with the counseling and then EMDR counseling like they have for war veterans and the uh, memory started coming back because I had PTSD 30 years later, I had absolutely no memory of what had happened that day, no conscious memory. Uh, but then uh, PTSD symptoms started showing up a few years before they hit full force. And I didn't even know what was happening. I didn't even know what PTSD was. I had to Google it, <laughs> what, what, what I was experiencing. And I was desperate for help. And uh, I was just um, so uh, thankful for all the people that did help me uh, along the way. And uh, of course, that trauma impacts every other area of your life. But uh, miraculously, I was able to marry and, and have a wonderful family and, and have a really a very normal life. Uh, but I guess it was just time to, to heal. And, uh, and so it was just uh, so thankful for all the people along the way. But there was absolutely no roadmap that I had uh, to go through. And the Lord just guided me uh, day by day. Um, on what to do and it was not an easy journey and uh, some people um, uh, people will wonder why don't you just um, try to go get healed right away well there's pain involved in the healing process but for me it was the the pain of staying where I was uh, uh, had become much greater than uh, pressing forward and, and trusting that uh, everything was going to be okay
Oh, and I, I did uh, want to uh, share just one more thing, if it's okay, uh, Ina. Of and course. that is, uh, yeah, one of the, um, after working through all the, you know, the practical things, the counseling, the MDR, uh, self-education on uh, sexual trauma and things like that, um, I think one of the things that brought the greatest healing uh, to, my, uh, to me, um, my heart and soul, was that uh, you know, during a time with uh, prayer with the Lord, uh, I don't know how to describe the experience. Uh, it probably happened in just a, f a few seconds at most, but I, I could write a whole book on it. Uh, but uh, it was like the Lord took me back there because you're wondering, where's this good God? When all this happened to me and I had survivor's guilt too, because uh, the girls didn't get away like I did. And so in a moment, he showed me the whole scene. It was like in the basement of this huge high rise, probably in Denver, downtown ben Denver somewhere with these great uh, concrete pillars. And, and I saw the whole line of girls and myself, like you know, bright lights on us and dark everywhere else. But uh, the Lord just, uh, just in a moment, let me know he was there, even though it seemed like I was abandoned. And he was there for the girls. And uh, I just knew, somehow I just knew he had a way of escape for them as well, but it was going to look different than mine. And, uh, and he was even reaching out for the perpetrators. And I was like, I could see one of the perpetrators was responding uh, to the Lord's call to them to turn from what they're doing. Uh, but he was hidden behind one of the pillars and he was breaking down crime. And uh, I'm sure he had to hide or they would have probably killed him if they had seen him uh, doing that. But that brought so much healing to my heart uh, because that's, uh, even though I had great faith in the Lord, it just shook me to my core. And that's what happens with trauma. It just blows your, out of the uh, water uh, beyond your grid to, uh, function. And it, it tries to steal your trust. And, um, but uh, through uh, God's help and people like Ina and Glenn and Michael and his audience, um, and, and with y'all with compassionate hearts, uh, part of the, uh, healing that he brought to me. So thank you so much again for the opportunity to share. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for sharing your story with us. Glenn, do you have any um, comments or things that you would like to share yeah. with Jeffrey after listening to his story? It's an incredible story. And um, yeah, I'm very grateful that you had that experience of of Jesus bringing you into the light. And that was, um, and to be able to recognize that He was there with you. That's a very profound experience in itself. And thank you for sharing that. Oh yes, sir. Thank you so much, Glenn. Yeah, Jeffrey, in in so much trauma yet. There is so much potential for healing and growth. Um, but like you said, it is a painful journey to go to that. And um, and I feel like that is what stops so many survivors, regardless of gender, to mm -hmm. start that healing process, um, which actually will goes right into our, our conversation. Um, and if that's OK with you, too, I'd like to ask you a couple questions. Sure. So, Jeffrey. What has been most helpful to you in your healing journey after your traumatic experience of human trafficking? Sure. Um, definitely um, um, my relationship with the Lord Jesus. Um, I, I just uh, had him uh, to go to and, um, and, and he helped me along the way. But I will say I was at, at times angry with the Lord. Um, because you just can't understand, um, you know, how something like that can happen. And because um, it not only impacts you, of course, it impacts the other people in your life. And uh, but that's, um, you know, he's uh, he's given people free will and they make their choices and people's bad choices do impact us. 
and uh, but he's uh, given me a way to uh, just forgive people. It never makes what they've done right ever, and uh, that's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is just releasing uh, vengeance uh, to God, and uh, and just uh, asking for His healing, and then uh, taking that pain, uh, I believe is what he's helped me in turning it around positively uh, to reach out and help others. And so I, I, I'm willing to do uh, whatever it takes in this area that he would have me do uh, to uh, help people. Uh, as Zena and uh, Glenn and Michael and, and your audience uh, to educate people on what's going on uh, and also it, uh, first responders and advocates, and also um, uh, people that uh, love uh, people that have been traumatized uh, like that. So, um, I, and I believe uh, I'll be writing more books um, because I'm continually learning, and um, and uh, also uh, uh, writing some songs. And the and it won't be a dark subject; it'll be full of hope because. Um, uh, when, when you've uh, just been able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and um, and um, you, you begin to fear no evil because uh, he really is with you, really is with me. And I realize he's with me and not just everyone else, but but me. And, and um, that is the greatest comfort and strength we could ever have in our lives. Uh, yeah. And I, I would like to say just a quick caveat. Um, and I'm so sorry for anyone that has uh, been victimized or people they love been victimized by someone who is supposed to represent uh, God and, and Jesus Christ. Because that is not who God is. He is love. He loved us so much. He sent Jesus and, to, and gave him. He took all of our uh, punishment and our sins upon himself so that we could have a relationship with the Lord. And um, and so I'm so sorry for anyone that's experienced that trauma that I can't imagine what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it was, uh, at least in my young mind, it was evil people doing that. But it, if someone who's supposed to be God or Jesus representative to me, where do I have to go? So I'm so sorry for that, but that is not who he is. And uh, there is the genuine. There are counterfeits, but if there's a counterfeit, there's a genuine. Hmm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for that uh, that answer. That was absolutely very heartfelt. And um, Glenn, what do you think is most helpful to male survivors after they experience trauma? especially childhood sexual abuse or exploitation yes. through trafficking? Yes, I, you know, I I think um, what Jeffrey said was really helpful. And um, I think finding someone who is prepared to really s listen to you is absolutely key. You know, one of the challenges is that um, is in, our, in everyone's busy lives, we don't sit down and listen to each other and listen to people. And, um, you know, actually, it may not be it may not be the counsellor or or the doctor or somebody who you think is going to be the one who's best li listening to you. It may be someone that's just like just an old lady or an old or or a young man. It might be somebody who but they, they're willing to sit down and to hear your story. Um and don't give up on trying to find that person because sometimes the first, second, third, maybe even, you know, a ninth person is somebody who's not very good at listening. They may be people who just don't get it. They misunderstand you. They interpret things that aren't there. Um, don't give up because there will be somebody like Jeffrey was saying this. There's, there's the authentic people who really do want to help you and are willing to sit down and listen to you. So I think that's the absolutely vital thing. And I um, I think that um, 
those of us who are, who are professionals uh, in this area, social workers, health workers, and so on, we, we need to get trained. But the most important thing is that we know that we learn how to listen. And we all know what we're supposed to do. Let's just do it. Um, so I think that's really important. I think um, if you're part of a, a church or um, a, a religious community that you feel um, supported in, that's great. And, uh, you know, listen to other people, listen to God, see how, if you experience some kind of enlightenment in the same way that Jeffrey did. But if you if you don't get that in the church that you're part of, then move to another church. Don't be afraid to do that or move to another religious community. There are, there are communities that will hold you and love you and support you. And there are communities that won't. Uh, that can be too judgmental. Um, I think particularly for boys in this area, they the, the, the challenge is that you may have some boys who are um, who are labelled gay mm -hmm. if they uh, confess what's happened to them, um, and you have and they may not be gay, and that's mm -hmm. really hard for them. And then there may be other other boys who are, are labelled gay who are gay or they feel that same sex attraction. But they don't need someone pointing the finger and saying, you know, what have you done? You've led this person on. Mm -hmm. They need to know that they are, um, that they're okay, that they're loved, that they're accepted for who they are. Um, and uh, then it may be that they, that's when I'm talking about the type of church that you're part of. Um, mm -hmm. There are some churches who are, uh, give people the choice between their sexuality or their um, or their um, faith and if you're in that kind of a church then move out of it because it's not helpful to you in the long in your long-term healing um, and also sometimes churches can be very unhelpful when it comes to faith because they say you must forgive people when they haven't really, they don't really understand what that means. I think Jeffrey's definition of forgiveness is really helpful because it's not about it's not, it's about releasing those um, those feelings, those things that are holding you down. That's really the key thing. And so finding a, somebody who can help you to process that is really good. But don't get take on the burden of um, pastors and and leaders who are telling you that you um that you mustn't you know really putting pressure on you to forgive when you're not ready to forgive and right. uh just allow it to happen when it's appropriate for you yeah. um i think another thing is um if you're brave enough is to to write down your story i think sometimes writing your story can be very therapeutic and it can help you um, it may be hard for you to express um, your story to somebody, but actually helping to write it down can be helpful. And don't, again, there's not no pressure on you. Take the time that you need to do it. Take breaks when you need to do it, when you need those breaks. Um, and listen to, um, listen to your heart. Um, it may be that there are things that you can process that on your own. It may be that you need to have some support from a counsellor or somebody who's um, it, on that journey. But I think sometimes actually putting it down clarifies things in your head that you wouldn't otherwise have done, have experienced. So those are a few uh, things I wanted to suggest. I think for, um, for young boys in particular, sometimes it can be very hard for them to... Um, to experience, um, to, to, to know how to express. They don't know the words for it. Um, I remember hearing a story about a young boy, must have been three or four, and he would play in the sand pit and he would build a phallus out of the sand and then smash it. And that was his way of indicating that he, that he had experienced sexual abuse. And the, uh, the nuns who were working with him they realized that because they observed him and they saw him and they took time to to do that they weren't they didn't just ignore it they they understood that that was what was happening and then they were able to help him and support him so 
you know, even with young children, there's ways of listening that may be, um, may be actually more than just using your ears. There's ways to, that we can do that. So those are some ideas. Um, maybe we should move on to the next question. Uh, that was, uh, if I can tag on to uh, Glenn, uh, what you just, the last thing you just shared, uh, it's, it's uh, listening with the heart, and that's what the nuns were doing. Yeah. And uh, yes. yes. And, and I, I did want to, you know, I don't want to uh, gloss over everything. The church world is just a wonderful, perfect place. It's absolutely, absolutely not. <laughs> That's why Jesus came, because <laughs> we're all a mess. And uh, <laughs> and so uh, so actually, my faith community, when this uh, PTSD hit, uh, they had uh, no clue and really didn't want to hear it. And I had to go somewhere else. Uh, basically, the attitude was... Uh, uh, well, that's too bad. Uh, get over it, <laughs> uh, kind of in a nutshell. And so, I just realized that they weren't safe. I still loved them. I was able to get connected to them, and I stayed connected to them on the level that I could. But I just couldn't go there with them with that. And the Lord was faithful to uh, take me somewhere else. And on the positive side, I met another believer who actually. Uh, worked uh, with my uh, wife at the time and uh, she was a massage therapist and a believer and um, uh, she was that safe person and uh, she wept with me and when I shared the story and it meant so much she was the only person in my life that wasn't paid to listen to me uh, to that point i.e counselors Mm. it meant so much mm. that she was Jesus to me mm. thank you very much Jeffrey for, for sharing that and Glenn for your excellent points and that kind of brings me back to the, the research that um, that we all were a part of and the importance of of that healing journey and getting out of this era of silence and finally breaking that silence by um by looking into a little bit of self-research of what has happened to me, reaching out to other peer groups on even anonymously telling your story, hearing other people's story. That's a great first step. You don't even have to be public about your story. And, and something that I would love survivors to know is you don't have to be public about your story. You don't have to tell everyone your story if you experience this, but to get that weight off your shoulders, at least find one or two safe people that you can talk to because that will get that burden off of your heart and then just some freedom out there. You don't have to tell the world, but at least a few that you have in mind that you know are safe people that will listen, that will believe you. And wh what the survivors were telling me in the research was um, their, their thing what it wasn't we need everyone to be trained we need everyone to be trauma informed it was we need to be listened to we need to be you know talked to like a person we need our human rights back and i think a lot of frontline professionals we kind of jump in the deep end before even addressing those primary um, really important factors of just treat the other person like a human being and with respect, uh, listen, believe. Uh, those are huge factors for mm -hmm. if someone starts healing or if someone goes back into re-traumatization and is re-triggered. And so those are very important things that do mm -hmm. help um, both female and male survivors in the healing journey. So that it has been a great um, first question. So let's go into the next question. How can we ensure that survivors of human trafficking have access to the resources and support they need to heal and grow both within and outside our faith communities? Jeffrey, would you like to start us with this? Sure. Um, uh, just, um, I, I guess it's just like any other uh, product, we'll say. Uh, what uh, we're uh, selling or hopefully giving away by because of the generous people of the giving, but um, is hope and healing. And the same way being out there on the internet, uh, maybe even doing commercials, but uh, not, not just emphasizing um, 
emphasizing the, the, the positive, not, not uh, negating the negative, but some kind of balance that shows, has a short story. Because uh, just like Ina, um, you know her story. She um, worked at an orphanage, I believe, in Central America, mm-hmm. and was uh, just once she was there with the children that had uh, been impacted by sex trafficking. It just changed her world and changed her heart. And I believe um, uh, people have awesome hearts out there. They're just not aware, or um, and not everybody's called to this. But if you are, um, and just it's like sowing seeds um, by being out there, uh, so to speak, just like you would be selling anything else. Only this is um, not selling anything. It's, it's sharing and giving away hope and, and resources and pointing people to resources. Um, yeah, and not only for the healing of victims, but education and, and prevention. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Glenn, is there anything that you would like to add to that um, on the topic of how do we ensure that survivors of human trafficking have access to resources and support to help them heal and grow? Yeah, I, I think um, I think that, first of all, um, survivors, male survivors need to know that there are resources out there um, that they because I think they often feel because most of the uh, media is portraying girls and young women who are trafficked and there's very little that says anything about boys so they need to know that it's it's that they're included that it's about trafficking of human beings not trafficking of girls and women Um, and so and with the prevention materials as well you know we need to think about that so for example we've developed some training materials for young children um, about sexual abuse and exploitation, and we've included boy, uh, boys and girls, so that it normalises the idea that boys um, are sexually abused and exploited too. Um, and I think that's very important. So those are some things. I think when it comes to survivors, they, um, I think many of them have no idea that there's stuff there. there there's stuff available. Um, so I think we need to, um, we need to get posters. Um, for clinics and we need to educate children in school um, and we need to communicate that uh, this is a problem not just for 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 girls but for boys as well and I I think churches um, churches sometimes feel that they don't want to talk about sex with children because they might go ahead and try and do it Um, the reality is that children need to be educated on what's uh, what's appropriate uh, uh, sexual behavior that's going to be helpful to them. them. Um, you know, sexual behavior that's about love and about relationship, uh, not about um, abuse, and uh, and that it's about consent. Um, and those are messages which seem to be, have been a little bit lost in our current media. We need to bring that back into focus and say that that's important. So educating children about pornography, uh, saying that pornography isn't real sex. Pornography is actually, um, it's photographing and videoing abuse of people. Um, and, and people need to understand that. And um, uh if anyone's interested, I've also been involved in um, doing research with men, uh, uh, Christian men in particular, uh, on their sexual behaviour. And w- it's really important that we don't just focus only on porn, but we also encourage men to behave um, in, a, in a responsible and good way. Uh, and that includes um, not um, using prostitutes. Uh, so that when we we uh, look at addressing demand, we're starting with ourselves mm-hmm. and saying this is an important topic. And we we uh, and so it's no good for the churches to be silent about any of this stuff. It's really important that they they address it, because if they don't address it, then somebody else will. And it's not going to be someone who's helpful um, to our children. Thank you very much, Glenn. Did you have anything to add to Glenn's points, Jeffrey? 
Oh, that uh, was just excellent, Glenn. And uh, I agree. Uh, you know, if somebody else is going to step in into the vacuum, uh, you know, and it's not going to be good. Yeah. And uh, but uh, just that, uh, you know, sex is God designed it. It's about giving uh, to the person uh, a, uh, in, in a marriage. Uh, that is the original design in a marriage, uh, the covenant protective relationship to give to them. Uh, not to get from them what you can get. Mm -hmm. And that's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To go off of your point, Jeffrey, I think that's really important of, and, and Glenn, that we need to be there for our children, for our communities, because if we aren't, these are the vulnerabilities that are literally putting targets on these children from perpetrators. And this mm -hmm. is literally how the grooming process is. Yes. Um, they see those vulnerabilities, a child that's not being listened to, a child that is not feeling loved, that is being neglected, that is abused. Those are our most vulnerable children. And that's regardless of gender who we need to put the most attention. I mean, all the children we need to put most attention on, but if we aren't there for them, they will be. And so we need to be very careful with that. And I feel like uh, for frontline professionals like yourself, Glenn and I, um, we we need to really make sure that we continue to collaborate and to as much as possible to have things open access. So when those survivors do look online, literally a Google search of what is this and what help do I have? They can find these resources that aren't thousands of dollars that are at least you, the research that we have done that is free that they can read, that they can see, okay, I can go here. This could be my next step. This can be the next uh, NGO I look into, into their resources and things like that. And I think that through that, it highlights our strengths and it other it also covers our weaknesses because by collaborating and partnering with each other, um, for example, you know, as researchers, we don't have uh, we don't we don't have those safe homes. We don't we aren't those counselors. We aren't those therapists. But through these partnerships, we can say, okay, I can look into the research, but then I can tell a survivor, okay, well, this is the safe home if you need, and and you can go to this. Um, already vetted therapist or, and you can go to this website to look for these resources and and so by kind of partnering collaborating I think it really just makes us stronger together um, and I, I hope that that can really bring some change in the future for for uh, victims and survivors of of any gender Absolutely. and so that yeah uh, if I could tagline no, uh, on ahead. that um, it's just and rec recognize, we all recognize, uh, you know, we're going to have differences um, uh, and we may not agree on everything, um, you know, whether we're in a church or not. Uh, but I, I think if there's a rallying cry in this earth, it's uh, let's protect the children. I think everyone can agree on that, regardless of your faith or no faith or your background. Um, yes. and. Um, so I so admire uh, Ina and Glenn and Michael and, and everyone here listening uh, to have that heart to do that. Mm. Thank you, Jeffrey. And so to our last question, how can we ensure that survivors of human trafficking are not just surviving, but are thriving? And what are some key steps that we can take um, that needs to be taken into account to create more of a just and equitable society for all. So Jeffrey, would you like to open it up? Sure, uh, mine was just real pointed. Uh, I know there's other things uh, out there, uh, but uh, what came to uh, my mind and heart was, because uh, uh, this is what was very, very helpful to me, uh, was um, hearing anyone's story uh, that gave me hope, uh, testimonials, and that could be in any any number of forms. It could be on a short uh, commercial or a YouTube commercial or all the way up to a book or um, and even uh, it'd be wonderful to have a movie out there that treated the subject um, with dignity and compassion, but would instill hope. Um, I love inspirational movies. My favorite stories in books and movies are true stories. 
mm. of people that are overcome. Uh, they just speak to me so much. Mm. And uh, when I'm at a low spot, uh, sometimes I'll I'll put that on. I like the Cinderella Man with Russell Crowe about James Braddock in the late 20s, early 30s, uh, who was a, a champion boxer eventually, but uh, he went through some very hard times uh, and was able to overcome. And uh, the reason why he said he knew what he was fighting for, and that was milk, because he loved his children. Mm. Thank you very much, Jeffrey, for sharing that. Um, Glenn, is there anything that you would like to add on how we can ensure that survivors of human trafficking are not just surviving, but thriving? And mm. what we can do to create a more just and equitable society for all? Yes, that's a very good question. I think um, in terms of a just and equitable society, um, you know, sometimes I think we think that we're um, moving towards that and other times we realize that we're not and we need to be honest with ourselves um, and I think the church in particular needs to be a good example in that we need to encourage everyone in the church or in our, whichever uh, faith we're a part of that that's something that we can only do if we're committed to it um, not it's not just going to happen accidentally so I think um, that means that we need to be better at listening that's one of the things I think that we've talked about that, that's become a recurring theme in this podcast but I think it's so important that we become better at listening to people we may not be experts in we cannot be experts in other people's experiences people are experts of their own stories and they know their stories but we can't do as professionals that's not what we can do as churchgoers that's not what we can do as pastors that's not what we can do but what we can do is be a good listener. So let's all try to do that a bit better. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. That, that's absolutely so true. And uh, I would like to add that um, I think something that we really need to start pushing more and more to do is survivor inclusion, survivor voices, making sure that they're, they have a seat at the table. We write a lot of policy programs, projects globally, locally, and we're not even listening to the very people that we're trying to help. And I think one of the most important things to do is, is to bring to the people to the table that, that these things are about because they, they know what they need. We can't just tell them, oh, you need this. And, and then it's just going to work out. And it can be a completely, a complete thing that is, is what they didn't ever want or need in the first place. And so I think actually, like you said, listening to them, bringing them to the table, including them um, into projects, into policy, into change, um, or into just these podcasts or webinars, something mm. that we can show the public that there is change, that it is okay to share your story. And I feel like once a survivor or a victim are going through that healing journey, um, and they are, they are finding some healing and some inner growth and post traumatic growth through that. It's I find it really important to start those hobbies or those things or those games or those toys that bring you joy. Just start healing that inner child that um, that everyone has. And mm -hmm. and one of the most impactful little moments that I had when I was interviewing a few male survivors was um before the abuse started for one male survivor he always wanted a train set and he loved trains and he just he loved it as the four-year-old little boy but once the abuse started that of course he never had a train set he went through all this trauma and it was only until he was around 65 that he goes you know what i'm gonna buy myself a train set and he bought himself one and he set it up and he made this huge thing and it brought him so much healing and joy because it healed his a part of his inner child and it let him be a kid again and it let him heal that part of himself and it let him bring other passions um, from traveling to cooking to spending time with friends or family, whatever it was. But I really recommend once, a, once anyone goes through any kind of traumatic experience, 
also heal that inner child because that's what's really going to have a holistic healing approach to the person Mm -hmm. and what's really going to bring you joy at the end of the day because we're not meant to just do our nine to five go home eat sleep start it all over we need to have some joy and peace love Mm -hmm. um, in our lives and that's what i really hope for for anyone that is going through anything that is painful any kind of trauma it's pretty much everyone on the planet. Um, so then hopefully, you know, they can heal that, but also their inside, uh, their inner child as well. Very, uh, very impactful stories, Jeffrey and, and Glenn. And, uh, and I would like to ask you, Jeffrey, um, you had mentioned a book. Could you please tell us a little bit about your book and how can we get it? Oh, yes, uh, please. And, uh, yes, it's out there on Amazon. It's in, um, paperback, mm-hmm. uh, Kindle ebook, as well as audio. And, uh, Ben Hawk, he did an awesome job on the audio, very professional, uh, man, uh, out of New York City, young man. And, uh, yeah, just after writing and rewriting the story, uh, so many times, I listened to it for the first time when he did it. It, it was just like, uh, a new experience for me mm-hmm. in, a, in a good way. It brought healing to me by hearing that book in a different form. Um, and so I just uh, wanted to say that, you know, um, I can't take credit for anything uh, good in the book. I just had the privilege to be able to write it. And uh, I believe it's just uh, this book's uh, a gift uh, of, of hope uh, to uh, just uh, not only victims, of course, the victims, but uh, the people that love them and advocate for them and um, and even perpetrators. Uh, that There's hope. Uh, there's a way of escape for you, for each one um, out of darkness and, and in that place of light and love. And uh, I'm just so thankful to have been able to be a part of that. Uh, it was just orchestrated through uh, people, uh, many people like Ina, she was a part of, uh, of the process and uh, other wonderful people. And um, Patrick Erlandson is another one, a filmmaker in Southern California. It's uh, uh, he makes uh, films and also has an organization called FatherCon um, that uh, helps us equip dads to be good dads at the ultimate. Uh, first line of defense against sex trafficking. Um, And I I would like to share just one quote um, uh, that he, uh, just a short one out of the recommendation of the book, if it's okay. And um, and it is, um, this treasure of a book does not demonize. In fact, it's a refreshing response to the reasonable question, where was this loving God when I was being abused? Jeffrey tells of his experience in which Jesus shows him that he was there appealing to the trafficker and abusers uh, to turn from the evil in their hearts and was not turning a blind eye to the victim, uh, nor to the twisted heart of the victimizer. And uh, it's just, uh, he gave voice to what I wasn't able to say that, uh, uh, and so yeah, just um, I would have never written the book to, to try to make money. It was too painful to write. Um, but uh, my motivation was that um, it would help people. And uh, so, it, yeah, so it, it 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 is out there on Amazon. I imagine you can buy it anywhere in the world. Um, and so you could just type in The Way of Escape, uh, my, my last name, Tenet, T-E-N-N-A-N-T. And Amazon or go straight to the uh, Amazon website and type in the way of escape and my last name, Tenet, and uh, you'll be able to find it. Do you want to show us? Show us a copy of it. Oh, yes. Thank you, Glenn. I appreciate that. And uh, this is uh, the the front cover of the book. Sorry, it's a glossy cover. (laughs) Uh, So, but uh, hopefully you can see it well enough on the uh, video. And uh, this is a uh, brilliant picture of uh, actually uh, a precious woman from the UK uh, that uh, 
did this uh, cover for me of a, a young man running out of a horrible place into the light. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Jeffrey, that is absolutely incredible. And I'm so happy that you're able to put your, your story into words and hopefully into song in the future. Yes. That's fantastic. And, and Glenn, is there anything that you would like to share with us? Any recent work or resources? Um, yeah, I would. Um, the first of all, I'd like to tell you about um, a, a guy called Perry Power, who's um, a survivor of um, sexual abuse um, from his grandfather and wrote his own book. Um, and he has started a group of about 20 people who are getting together weekly to talk about writing their own story. And um, I think it's a very uh, exciting uh, way of exploring your story in a supportive group of people. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and then also, I want to encourage you to have a look at this book. So this is one, the, the, one, the first of a trilogy of um, edited volumes that are aimed at people Christians really working to address the issue of trafficking. This is the first one, Stopping the Traffic. The second one is called, um, can you see it? Oops. Yeah, there we are. Finding Our Way Through the Traffic. And then the third one, which is should be coming out any time now, it's not quite finished publication, um, is called Standing Back from the Traffic. So they're all um, play on words, of course, but they're all about navigating some of the complexities of a Christian response to sex trafficking in particular, but other forms of trafficking too. So um, some of them are some of the articles are written by theologians, others are written by social workers, people working directly with um, survivors. And it's an extraordinary collection of um, essays so I will en would encourage you, if you're a Christian and you're working in this sphere, then please, um, whatever area you're in, please uh, have a look at these books. They're available from Regnum Publishing, R-E-G-N-U-M Publishing, and you can get uh, soft copies of the first two anyway um, for about six pounds, which is about eight US dollars. Fantastic, Glenn. Is, Very good. Glenn, is that uh, out of the UK? It is out of the UK, but I think some of these books are now av available. Um, I think that they, they're available, um, well, because the soft ones, of course, are available anywhere in the world. So you can just you can just download them um, but you, and you have to pay for them, obviously. But um, it's uh, it, it allows you to pay uh, internationally. So thank you so much, Jeffrey and Dr. Glenn Miles, for sharing with us your time and your expertise on this topic. Do you have any final thoughts, Jeffrey or Glenn? Oh, I just I want to thank Ina and Glenn and Michael uh, for hosting the webinar and, and this audience. And thank you all for your hearts of compassion and uh, the opportunity to, to join with you. I love... Um that Jeffrey uh, has spoken so much about the word hope and this it can often feel like an area which is so dark and hopeless. So I just love that we can end this with um, that sense of real hope, that there is hope. As you heard about today, the journey of male survivors of trauma, including those that have experienced human trafficking, is complex and multifaceted. It is essential to uncover and identify the social interactions that harm and aid male survivors' recovery and healing, as well as the barriers that hinder disclosure. By providing a safe and supportive environment, empowering survivors by reclaiming their agency and fostering community engagement, we can ensure that male survivors have access to resources and support that they need to heal and to thrive. As we continue to explore and address these challenges faced by male survivors, it is essential to prioritize trauma-informed care and to create a more unjust and equitable society for all, regardless of their gender. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank all the survivors for their commitment and bravery throughout both studies.
as well as my partners and field experts that have dedicated so much time to helping uh, male survivors in their own fields. So here we can see the publication and both of these are available. Um, please feel free to reach out to me if you would like a free copy of the, of the journal.